Hare Krishna, everyone. Hare Krishna. Okay, so um, let's let's say some prayers and then we'll get into the um, to the session. Okay. Omagiana Tamaranda Sya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshu Militamyena Tasmai Shri Guruvena Maha Sri Chaitanya Manobishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Uta Padakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavamscha Sri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raganatam Vitam Twam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Virjana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakam Vitamscha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sutta Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Talpa Turubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhyevacha Patitanam Bhavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Shri Vasudhi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So again, taking permission from His Holiness John Muli Maharaj and also my seniors or the some advice and others. Um, yeah, so I was thinking about how to start this session. Before we even get into the verse, there's something I want to do. And that is, I was looking at some, um, some information about how we remember and also how we process things. And then after class, I was speaking to His Holiness John Muli Maharaj and um, we were having some discussion just on this idea of transformation. Louder? Oh, you can't hear. Okay, no worries. Okay, so um, what I was saying is before we start the actual verse, um, we want to do something very briefly. So after class this morning, I was speaking to Chan William Maharaj, and one of the things we were talking about is this idea of how people, how devotees transform, right? how devotees change, how we grow. And that, that in of itself is a huge topic. But one, one element of this is a model that we often like to talk about, which is mentioned in our Shastra. So it talks about, um, was it Shravanam, Manana, Nididhyasan, and Vandana. Okay, so Shravana is when we hear. Manana is the reflection on what's been heard. Nididhyasan is when we apply what we've heard. Vandanam also is, is, is um, prayer. So often, and that relates also especially to Kripa, one of the things we'll talk about in relation to this verse, fifth verse of Shikshashlikam, Kripaya, this idea of Kripa, mercy. So what I want to do before we get into this verse is I'm going to ask you to take a few minutes just with someone who's, near, who's sitting next to you and let's just take some time to churn because we've heard a lot. But we also know that hearing is very powerful, especially when it's attentive. But with the hearing, we really want to explore that. You know, Prabhupada will sometimes talk about um, looking at the teachings from different angles of vision. Right? So when we speak and discuss and share it, and when we think about what this means for me, how I can apply this in my life, we really take a step forward in our transformation, okay? So what I'd like you to do, just for five minutes, and just taking into account everything that, that you've heard so far, just what stood out to you, okay? So from all the classes, so any Maharaj's classes, anything you heard from our classes, but just five minutes or so next to you, if you could just share at least one thing that particularly stood out with you or resonated with you. The idea behind this is also that when we do this, what we may find sometimes is that when we're in the class and we hear something that particularly strikes us, we may consider that there may be some significance, there may be a particular reason why that really resonated with me. 
I like to watch the audience when I'm, when I'm speaking. And I'll, I'll tell you honestly, when we gave the um, third verse yesterday, I did notice at certain times I could see some reaction in the audience. You know, because you, you see the body language and sometimes it's just like something, oh, something struck or oh, I didn't see it like that. So just giving a little bit of time to just um, process that a little bit, okay? And, and we want to encourage that in our spiritual life in general. You know, we, we will hear a lot and it's all very, very valuable. There's also an expectation for us to reflect on what we've heard. When I hear Marge speak, I can see that he's reflected on it. That's why you have all this very fresh insight on the subject matter. And that's very, very important. It's very, very important for all of us because it's like digesting the teaching. You know, the chanting also helps us to digest the teaching. Discussing it in the association of devotees also helps us to digest the, the teaching. You know, this, this verse comes to mind. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Machita Madgata Prana Bodhayanta Parasvaram Kathayantis Cha Mamnityam Tusyanti Cha Rimanti Cha. He says, My devotees are experiencing great bliss and satisfaction from always enlivening each other about me. Yeah, it's a very beautiful verse. So just give. We'll give about five minutes, just with someone sitting nearby. What particularly has resonated with you so far? Just at least one thing. And how do you intend to apply that in your spiritual life? Especially in your practice, if it relates to your chanting, how do you intend to apply this in the chanting? Does that make sense, first of all? Okay, so we'll give you five minutes and then we'll begin, please. I'm going to ask everyone's attention. Hare okay, Krishna. I'm going to ask for everyone's attention again. Okay. So, how how was the conversation? It was very good. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> that's not. That's messy. Um, so yeah, we will just just to make that point. We want to encourage this. When we come together for retreats, one of the things I was um, reflecting on is last year, I believe, people come to retreats and they're very inspired. And then we go home. And when we go home, <laughs> you know, it's like this verse, right? This ocean of material. <laughs> so we go home and there's so many other things that come on. One thing that you may want to do is when, from now on, whenever you go to a retreat, you may want to, when you pick up something in the retreat that you think you can apply and that's useful for your spiritual life, my, my suggestion to you is that if you start practicing it while you're at the retreat, okay? So you pick, let's say that you go to a retreat and then you're inspired to do more reading. If you wait till you get back home and start doing the reading, what Maya will do is the moment you get back home, all the other responsibilities will hit you very, very hard. But if you get inspiration, okay, I should, you know, um, study more. If you start that new practice in the retreat environment, then what happens is as you go back into your normal environment, you're already, you've already got some momentum. You've got some movement. So therefore, you're more likely to carry that habit back into your other environment because you, practice, you started practicing it in the environment where you found the inspiration. You see the point? Yeah? So just something to think about, just for future retreats or, or any kind of you know, get-together, is that whatever you, whatever you take from a particular place, if there's something that you feel a strong inspiration to do or improve, start, pra start the practice in the retreat. Yeah? That way, you just you, you can you're more likely to carry that practice back into your day-to-day -day life. Okay, so we're going to read from Chaitanya Charitamrita Antilila. This is chapter twenty, text number thirty-two, which is this um, fifth verse of the Shikshashtikam. Um, we can just recite it together. It's a very beautiful verse, and Maharaj gave me some additional point, which we'll also touch on as well. So let's just recite it together. Ayinam datami jatim karam patitanam mam vishame bhavam budo kripayatava pada pankaja 
Stita Duli Sadvisham Vichintaya. Okay. Um, let's do the word for word. Ayi, O oh my Lord. Nanda Tanuja, the son of Nanda Maharaj Krishna. King Karam, the servant. Patitam, fallen. Mam, me. Vishame, horrible. Baba Ambudo, in the ocean of nescience. Kripaya, by causeless mercy. Tava, yo. Pada Pankaja, lotus feet. Stita, situated at. Duri Sadrasham, like a particle of dust. Vichintaya, kindly consider. Okay, translation by Zibangu Shilai Sibhakti Vedanta Swami Shilai Prabhupada Shilai Prabhupada Ki Cha. O my Lord, O Krishna, son of Maharaj Nanda, I am your return. Actually, when I, I'll recite this, but I want you to just listen in a very meditative mood. Okay, so if you want to close your eyes, whatever well, works, but just really tune into this. And what, I want, what I'd like us to do is just try and also attune to the mood with which this is being um, spoken. Okay. O my Lord, O Krishna, son of Maharaj Nanda, I am your eternal servant, but because of my own fruitive acts, I have fallen into this horrible ocean of nescience. Now please be causelessly merciful to me. Consider me a particle of dust at your lotus feet. Okay. So this is the um, fifth verse of the Shikshashtakam. And this verse, well, let's go back. We, so we know that the third verse that we read related to what stage? Nishta, right? So that was a stage of steadiness. And then the fourth verse, the verse we, we spoke about this morning related to? Ruchi. Okay. And we were making the point this morning that those, that freedom from those desires, Nadanam Najanam Nasundarim, that freedom from the material um, pleasure or taste for material pleasure, that devotee at that stage, they're, they're tasting something else. They're tasting that ruchi. So that taste is there for the practices. It's really important. So at Ruchi, one, one has a great taste for the practices of devotional service. A Shakti takes things a, a, a stage further. So before, I have a taste for the practice. At a Sakti, I have a taste for the person behind who I'm practicing for. Okay? So Shakti means literally attachment. Maya Sakta Manapata. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna tells Arjun, Asakta Mana with your mind attached to me. Right? So at this stage of a Shakti, uh, one has real attachment to Krishna as a person. So again, before it's the practice, that's the emphasis. Now the, the emphasis is the person. So I'm still practicing, but there's a real attachment to Krishna as a person. Beautifully, this verse, Ayi um, Nanda Tanuja, Nanda Tanuja, O Son of Maharaj Nanda Krishna, it, it's, it's very much waking us up to the personal understanding of Krishna, waking us up also to the understanding that Krishna has his own eternal abode. Krishna is the son of Maharaj Nanda. He has his own relationships, family members. So this is, um, this is a very, very deep and personal understanding about, about what others will call God. Right? So we know that the Supreme Personality of God, that Krishna, in Vrindavan, he actually has much more intimate, loving exchanges with his devotees. So Vrindavan is Madhurya Dham. It is the abode of deep sweetness. And it is where Krishna, in his association with his loving um, 
family members, friends, etc. The intimacy is so deep that they actually, there isn't a consideration of his godliness. The consideration is we love him purely for the person that he is, the qualities that he has. So this is, this is the direction that devotees are meant to go in. This is the direction that has been given by the resident of Vrindavan, Srila Prabhupada, coming from the spiritual world to give this opportunity to everyone. Um, in, this, in this verse, it has such a, a powerful mood. So first of all, the statement by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he first asserts, so he's f speaking to Krishna, son of Maharaj Nanda, intimate understanding of who Krishna is in Vrindavan. Then he'll say, he'll assert who he is, I am your eternal servant. This is actually also significant. At the stage of Asakti, one starts to get a glimpse of one's spiritual identity. Okay. What, what, what happens in, in, in the teachings of Krishna consciousness is very interesting. We meet the same concept again and again at different levels of advancement. Okay? So in the beginning stage, the conception is you're a servant of Krishna. Jiva Rasurupo Krishna Renitya Das. So that's our beginning point. Related to that, Krishna will tell Arjun, Dehino Sminyata Dehi Kumranyovanam Jara. Tata Dehantara Prapti Dira Tatra Namuyate. You're not the body. So he says, You're not this body, you are an eternal servant of Krishna. But that's general. Right? That's general. At a higher stage, at the stage of Ashakti, we start to get a glimpse, which particular servant am I of the Supreme Personality of Godhead? Right? So what is conceptual at one stage starts to become much more uh, vivid, clear and defined at another stage. Yeah. So in the beginning stages, you know, when, when someone is interacting with the philosophy, they're told that there is a God. Because they don't even believe in God or they're just wondering, is it true that there's a God? Beginning stage. In the higher stage, we understand who is, who is that God? What does he look like? Who is his family members? How does he dress? In the beginning stage, we're told that we should be a servant of Krishna, right? We should serve him. As we progress, we understand Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Smaranam, etc. There are different processes of, sur of service, of surrender. You should hear about Krishna. Chant Krishna's names, remember Krishna, etc. So everything goes from the general to the more and more specific and the more and more clear and insightful. It's always like that. It is similar to when you go to school. You know, the child is told, you know, first of all, just whole numbers, right? So one plus one equals two. When the child is more advanced, you come back to the same maths, but this time we're going to talk about fractions and decimal points. When the child is even more advanced, then we can talk about, you know, differentiation, integration, imaginary numbers. It's the same concept that we meet at the beginning, but we meet it again with more detail, with deeper understanding, deeper insight. So, when we come through the teachings, if we don't know this, sometimes devotees will get into conflict. What, Prabhupada said this, well actually, I read that Prabhupada said that. He probably said both things, actually. <laughs> Yeah? But it's just at different levels of detail for different personalities. I'll give you one example, which I think is always interesting for, for devotees. So, Prabhupada often talks about going back home, back to Godhead. So if someone really develops their Krishna consciousness, when they leave their body, where do they go? Where do they go? Who's, okay, who's, so who's the form of Krishna? Anyone, any other idea? Where do they go? So if someone perfects their Krishna consciousness, we hear this term, going back home, back to Godhead. Okay, so someone said, go look at Vrindavan. So, so when someone perfects their Krishna consciousness in this lifetime, they take birth again in the material universe where Krishna is performing his pastimes. You see? So we hear back to Godhead, the detail is that that's what it means. One takes birth somewhere in the material universe is where Krishna is performing his pastimes. And in that association, one gets, makes further progression. The one is very obviously exalted to even do that, you see? So you'll see again, something is explained generally, then when you dig into it, there's a lot more detail. That point, by the way, Prabhupada makes that point in, in the purple in the 10th canto of the Bhagavatam. 
I was reading it, I think towards the, la- towards the end of last year. So again, when you read more and more, what's general becomes more specific. Right? You get into more and more of the specific details. So, Lord Chaitanya is saying, I'm your eternal servant. But what's interesting here is at this stage, one is starting to gl- get a glimpse of exactly who, that per- who we are in a very specific sense, because there are different rasas. Lord Chaitanya actually doesn't emphasize all five rasas. He only emphasizes four of the five. He, he actually doesn't talk about Shantaras. Right? So he'll talk about you know, the you know, servitude, sadasya, onwards, right? So, so servitude, friendship, parental, conjugal. He will actually talk about those particular points. So, we talked about the difference between a Shakti and Ruchi. And what it means is that at this stage of a Shakti, one is giving up one's material ego. Okay? Two types of identity. Material identity, this I am mine. So it means, I think I'm the body, and those things related to the body are mine. You see? But at this asati, because one's attachment now is very, is very deep and very um, substantial towards Krishna, then you get this statement by Lord Chaitanya, I am your eternal servant. And this word is very interesting, kinkaram. So, this word kinkaram is made of two words. Kin means what? Karomi means I do. So the, so the, the implication is, what can I do? What can I do for you, Krishna? How can I serve you, Krishna? This, this essential point is extremely powerful. What we are actually trying to develop, ladies and gentlemen, we're really trying to develop in everything we do, is a service mentality, actually. Yeah? What we're trying to develop to really move forward in our Krishna consciousness is a mentality of service. And in fact, there is, a, there, is a, there is a very intimate connection between the engagement in Sankirtan, in the Nam Sankirtan mission, in the mission of sharing Krishna consciousness. It is intimately connected with this mood of selfless service. Beautifully connected. So, Srila Prabhupada stated that engaging in the Sankirtan mission is non different from entering into Krishna's Rasa Leela. It's an extremely exalted thing to say. It is non different from entering into Krishna's most intimate pastimes. Why? It is because in engaging in service with the right mood in the spreading of the Krishna consciousness movement for the pleasure of, of Sri Guru, Srila Prabhupada, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. That gives one the qualification to understand Krishna and his associates in Vrindavan. Okay? I want to elaborate on this. This verse, in this verse, Lord Chaitanya is saying, Due to, because of my own fruitive acts, I have fallen into this horrible ocean of nescience. The challenges that we experience as devotees are blessings, actually. The reason is this. In order to enter into spiritual consciousness, one has to have a service, a life which is, which has the characteristics whereby it will squeeze out of the heart of every devotee all selfish desires for our own sense gratification. That's the purpose of it, is to remove all impurities all, all selfish desires from the heart. And when that is done, then Sri Krishna Chaitanya Radha Krishna Nahi Anya. By pleasing Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu through his mission, we can understand Radha and Krishna in Vrindavan. Hmm? So our challenges and our tests, they are expressions of the mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. If we are able to take them in the proper mentality or the proper context. Now, going back to something we said previously, that doesn't mean that we, uh, that we are um, foolish, we lack discrimination, that we're unintelligent about how we do things. Not at all. It means the opposite. Because that's part of the teaching. And that's part of the lesson. Part of the lesson is to offer the intelligence in service by reading the books, inquiring from the devotees, applying the philosophy 
in every time, place and circumstance. But behind it all is the development of the service mentality. Now, I want to just explore this a little. Someone gives you a hard time, but you are fixed in a, in a mentality of service. Does it change the way that you respond to that person, yes or no? Yes. Absolutely. You see the difference? So it's, very, it's a very easy way to see what's my mentality is by seeing, especially in times of difficulty, how do I respond? Yeah. Again, it's all about being foolish or about being docile or it's not about also not asserting when it's necessary to assert, but we should look and see, do I see myself as a servant? Or, if I don't see myself as a servant, it means that I'm seeing myself as the enjoyer. Yeah? And all of the troubles of everyone come to, to the degree that we've not let go of the desire to try to lord it over the material energy. You see, the material energy is very interesting. When you try to control her, she controls you. You see? It's designed like that. The more you try to control the material energy, you'll find the more she controls you. Sometimes people get into drug taking. Their desire is that I wanted to enjoy. But what they find is after a very short period of time, they are now addicted to the drug. So rather than enjoying the drug, the, ju the drug is controlling them. And we will see that actually that's how the material energy works. The material energy works like that. But, it, but, there's, a, but there's another side to it. The more we try to serve Krishna, offering Krishna's energy back to Krishna, the more the actual material energy takes a different mood. She responds differently to every single devotee according to our consciousness. You see? This, this material world is like a living classroom. And even aside from karma, because Krishna can change your karma easily, right? Even aside from karma, if we approach the things of this world in an enjoying spirit, the actual material energy will respond differently because, that mater the, because the material energy will perceive the consciousness with which we're approaching. So many of the tests and difficulties that we experience in our lives, if we want to see where it's coming from, we can look at what was I thinking about? What was my mentality? Yeah? What was the mentality behind that behavior? So, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is talking about this material world as an ocean, a horrible ocean. Right? And he says, somehow or other I've fallen in. Very beautiful point is made here, Kripaya. Right? He's, asking to, he's asking for mercy. This exact way he phrases it. Now please be causelessly merciful to me. This is very significant for us. If we understand how Krishna consciousness works, it will change everything about the mood in which we practice and the way in which we chant. Prabhupada is very beautifully given this particular point. He says one should chant like a child calling for their mother. Isn't that interesting? Now, we can hear that so many times that we can, that we can think, yeah, that sounds nice. Let's move on. But if you look at it, it's so profound. It's, there's an echo here, right? Krishna, I, you know, I've, I've got myself into this really horrible situation. Now you please be causelessly merc merciful and pick me up. The difference between the process of bhakti and other so-called religious processes is that in most cases those so-called religious processes are ones where people feel that they have to make themselves perfect. So there's this idea that I will become perfect by my own strength. I do it, you know, and, and, then, and then along with that comes the ego. I did it. Wherever I've attained, you know, I've done it. Krishna consciousness is something very, very different. Krishna consciousness is where we are, we are asking to be, to be raised by the shelter, the love and the strength of the Supreme Person. And when we understand that, it actually, it actually reflects in the mood of our practice. Again, Prabhupada's comment, like a young child calling for their mother, it means the young child who's calling out because he knows or she knows that there's shelter available for me. If I can just call out, then that shelter will come. Now, that's, that's this Kripaya. We ultimately require mercy. 
but mercy is also coming according to our effort. You see? So, there's, uh, when, I was, when I was at college, I studied sociology. And there was a study that they talked about. They did a study of education with young people. And they found <laughs> that there were certain students who the teachers would give, give extra help and extra encouragement to. Isn't that interesting, right? They found that those students who really were trying their best, really wanted to learn, the teachers picked it up. The teacher would see, oh, this person, they really, they really want to study, they really want to understand the subject. And the teachers would then, unconsciously, because they actually researched and they found that it wasn't that the teachers were deliberately doing it. In fact, when they asked the teachers, the teachers said, no, I teach everyone the same way. But the observation was that, no, you're giving extra help to this particular student. And that's how Krishna consciousness works. The endeavor is actually to attract mercy. Yeah? And if I understand that, then I know that I'm going to do everything I can, but it's only going to be perfected by the mercy that comes as a result. Sometimes it's said that you take one step to Krishna, he'll take a thousand steps towards you. Okay? It's very interesting. Then, you, then someone said, but how come this person's got more, more mercy than this person? Yeah, because this person took one step. This person took ten. So Krishna's impartial. He's reciprocating equally with everyone. But then it's that, how much do you want it? You see? That's the way it works. So what we're looking for in Krishna consciousness is we are looking for this mercy, kripaya. And there's, that's very beautiful because it means that I don't become perfect by my own strength. Yeah? That's the point. I don't become perfect by my own strength, but my full endeavor should be there. It's just like someone calling out for help. The more you really want help, the louder your voice becomes. The louder your voice becomes, the further away someone can actually hear you. The further away someone can actually hear you, the more likely that someone's going to come and going to actually lift us out. So we have so much opportunity to receive mercy. Yeah? Now related to that is this idea that receiving mercy also means perceiving mercy. I repeat that. Receiving mercy also means perceiving, seeing mercy when it comes. Sometimes we go through difficult challenges or circumstances and we don't realize how much is Krishna's mercy. How much some situation is distinctly there to help me to grow and to develop. Yeah. When I was speaking to Marge about this verse, he mentioned something very amazing. He mentioned how Prabhupada had talked about this verse, and this verse can be a very a wonderful prayer to help us in attentive chanting. Right? Think about that. This mood. My dear Lord, so first of all, I'm your eternal servant, but he says, because of my own fruitive acts. Right? This is also very interesting. He's not saying, You're, you know, you've put me in this situation, what, what's wrong with you? Why didn't you, you know, how, how come I ended up here? You know, sort it out, Krishna, like, what's going on? It's not like that at all. He, there's a full sense of responsibility. Because of my own fruitive activities, I've ended up in this situation and I can't get out. Yeah. The material world is like a maze with no exit. Right? You know these mazes? You can, go, you can go left or right. If there's no exit, then you're trapped. But there is one way out. If the helicopter comes above that maze and drops the ladder down, if you hold onto the ladder, it will pull you above it. That's, what, that's, actually, that's our process. Material life is like walking in the maze left or right. You know, whatever different processes, gyan, karma, yoga, you're, you're still in the maze. You're moving in different places in the maze. But transcendence means you go above it. Right? We transcend that particular material platform. The lessons that we don't pass, right? as devotees, very, be very clear about this. The tests and the lessons that we don't pass will not pass us. Yeah, this is really important. We will see you will undoubtedly see that there's certain recurring patterns that happen in your life, in our lives. You know, sometimes a Diwali doesn't get along with some Diwalis in one community. So then the Diwali thinks, you know what, I'm going to move somewhere else. Right? And when they move to another community, 
they encounter the same type of behavior with other devotees. Has anyone ever seen that happen before? Yeah. Which is a way of Krishna showing that there's something for us to learn, which is why we're being faced with that particular pattern again and again. By the way, it's not always like that. Sometimes it can be someone moves and, it's not, and they don't see the same pattern. But sometimes it's like that. So we actually, we have a great opportunity, which if I'm honest, I think that devo as devotees we often don't use. We have a great opportunity to just take a step back and look and see what are the lessons that keep coming into my life? What are the kind of individuals, devotees or non-devotees who keep coming into my life? What are the type of tests that keep coming into my life? And what do I need to do to pass those tests? It's very, very glorious. The tests are actually opportunities for graduation. You see? Just like when you go to school, if you pass the test, you graduate, you actually get something and you enter into a new field of existence. You, don't long, you no longer have to take these lessons again because you've mastered that particular lesson and therefore you can move on. So we, we owe it to ourselves actually to be compassionate enough to start to look. Why does this situation happen to me? What am I meant to learn from it? And what can I change about myself in order to improve the situation or the circumstance? I was having this conversation with one devotee the other day. We can't control what other people do. But what we can control is what we do. How we process things. How we evaluate our situation. How we arrange our life. And as we mentioned before, Krishna doesn't see so much what we do or how much we give. He sees how much we're holding back. Mm -hmm. So, one of the inspirations from this verse is that we should all try to really be mindful to practice the service mentality. Yeah? I can do something with my physical body, but my mind is elsewhere. And my attitude is elsewhere. But what we're trying to do is develop a mentality of service to Krishna and his devotees. And if you look at it, again, you see everything connects. What is, what is this Maha Mantra? You know, dear energy of the Lord, dear Lord, please engage me in your, in your service. And isn't it beautiful? In one place, Prabhupada translates it, dear, dear energy of the Lord, dear, dear Krishna, please accept me. Isn't that beautiful? Please accept me. Kinkaram, I'm your servant. If you allow me to serve, that's actually the sign that you've accepted me. Right? You've accepted my service. This is a very, very, very special and exalted thing. When, when Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared on the earth, his presence was teaching everyone something. Right? In the material world, the living entity wants to be God, wants to play God. It's our envy of Krishna. Why is he in charge? I should be in charge. Right? I think I would do a better job than he would. That's the mood. But Krishna himself, he wants to be the servant. Did you notice that? You see that it's just such a contrast. The conditioned living entities want to be God or want to play God, but the supreme person who actually is the supreme Lord, he actually relishes the position of a devotee. Not just any devotee, but he's topmost devotee because there are certain things that Srimati Radharani experiences that Krishna wants to relish, he wants to understand. Right? There's, there's a saying that you can never fully understand why people love you. Right? You can never fully understand why people love you because they're seeing you from the outside. Yeah? So they see you in a way that you can't see yourself. So Krishna is wondering, what is it about, what is it about me that Radharani relishes so much? And in coming as in, in the form of Sri Chaitanya, he is, he is experiencing that. Right? So actually, the most exalted position is this Kinkara. The most exalted position is actually the position of a servant. Right? So when, when Lord Chaitanya appeared, what well, he's actually, the message he's sending to humanity is, you don't need to envy me. Krishna is making that point. You don't need to envy me. 
because I have eternally given you a position superior to my own. Right? As a servant, I have eternally given you a position superior to my own. Right? The devotee gets to relish service to Sri Sri Radha and Krishna. Yeah. There's a place in Krishna book where Prabhupada writes that the gopis enjoy, they, they relish hundreds of millions of times more than Lord himself. It's in Krishna book. Yeah. Because of that mood, they're in the mood of service. So it's a very, very, it's inconceivable actually. But it's a very, very great blessing or gift uh, that, from the Lord. So let's just go through a few other points. So we talked about material um, identity, which comes from material attachment. So spiritual identity comes from spiritual attachment. And as we said, this asakti means that attachment. This idea of the, um, this idea of this material world being like an ocean. We see so many times reversals, isn't it? So something seems one way and then something suddenly changes to be another way. You know, you've just got your dream job and then there's a recession, right? The economy goes down and, and everyone gets, you know, is told that we can no longer, you know, employ you, you have to find something else. So sometimes Prabhupada calls these fallible soldiers. That when we take, when we try to take shelter in the material or the mundane, we're actually setting ourselves up for disappointment. And it's, and it's by our own doing. We've set ourselves up from disappointment by our own choices. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't use the material facility of the world. I'm not saying that. It's the mentality behind it that we have to change. And, we, and every single day, every 24 hours that we exist in this world is another opportunity to upgrade our consciousness. So what we can ask ourselves at the end of every day is, what did I do with the gift? Right, Prabhupada would often quote Chanakya. He says, millions of gold coins cannot buy back even one second of life that's wasted. Even one moment. You can be the wealthiest person. If you waste time, you can't back, you, there's nothing that can be done to get that time back. So when we reflect on these verses, it can help us to have aspiration. So this, this ruchi, what does it do? So we talked about how, but with this statue, this asakti, what does it do? At asakti, we talked earlier when we said that nishta, the fire, the blazing fire of material existence has been put out. We said that there are still smoke and embers. So at this stage of shakti, the smoke has literally gone once and for all. You know, which means that the influence of karma has ended at this, at this stage. Karma, yes. The influence of karma at the stage of a shakti has ended. Yeah. I'll give you one technical thing on that. See, even a pure devotee actually has some karma. But it's of a particular kind. So I remember hearing this in the class. So what happens, for example, with Srila Prabhupada, Krishna gives him a little karma just to keep him in that body. Because if you didn't have any karma, you could not stay in the material body. There'll be nothing to keep you in that material body. So Krishna administers just enough for that to keep that great personality here till he can do his service. But aside from that, the pure devotee has no karma. But even at this stage of uh, Shakti, karma is no longer influencing the individual. Yeah? So in proportion to how much we let go of our material identity, to that degree, our spiritual identity becomes more and more prominent or present. You know? So as we said, it starts to surface as a Shakti. And that realization of who we are in the spiritual world, that is considered to be the perfection of Sambandha Gyan. In other words, when your knowledge is perfect, because Sambandha Gyan means the knowledge of? Relationship. relationship. You see, so you can see, again, it's logical. If Sambandha Gyan means the knowledge of relationship, then the perfection of Sambandha Gyan would be to understand exactly the relationship that you have. Yeah? That's considered the perfection of it. Um, yeah. And at that particular stage also, the sadhaka's body is considered to now be fully spiritualized. Right? So this idea of vidya vadu jiva nam, yeah? that, that knowledge is actually the knowledge of one's identity. And as I said, as sati, it's a glimpse. It's not fully understood, but it's a glimpse at that stage. It's interesting also, the point that's made is that 
the um, instructions on cultivating one's spiritual identity can come in one of three ways. It can come through the spiritual master, it can come from realized sadhus, or if, if they're not, generally it comes through those kinds of sources, but if they're not present, then it can actually come internally in the purified heart of a devotee who's, who's purified the heart through the engagement in Nam Sankirtan. So, those deep, those deep realizations, that, that increasing understanding can come in that particular way. But again, it all relates to being free of the enjoying spirit. Our enjoying spirit is actually our enemy, because it's the enemy of our real ability to relish our relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Yeah. So whenever we find ourselves in the mood of thinking, what can I gain, how can I get, rather than seeing how can we do this in such a way that gives pleasure to Krishna and to his devotees, then we understand we still have some work to do. We still have something to change. And we spoke again this morning about that. Progressive stages means how do I engage better in Krishna consciousness? Because Krishna consciousness is like this. There was a, I think it was a famous sculptor. They said to him, how do you create such great sculptures? He said, well, when I look at a piece of you know, you know, marble or whatever, I, see, I just see the sculpture in that marble. And then I remove everything that is not that sculpture. Right? We are in a similar space. Perfection in Krishna consciousness is not when there is nothing more to add. Perfection in Krishna consciousness means when there is nothing left to take away. Okay, we've removed all the impurities, we've removed all, the, all that is not real, that is not true, that is not us. And when those things have all been removed, what is left is perfect. Okay? Again, this verse, I am your eternal servant. Lord Chaitanya, he establishes that, I know I'm your eternal servant, but I'm in, this, I'm in real trouble. And I can't get myself out of this dif difficult situation. Please, I beg you, you help me. If you help me, then I can get out. Yeah? And again, that mood is a mood that we can use in our chanting. We can, I think Maharaj was talking about that prayer, to, it could be very powerful to recite in order to actually chant attentively. I think that's the point you were making. It's very, very beautiful. In fact, if you look at the Shishashkam, if we're reading it properly, it should move us in some way. It should move us in some way. Because these are, they're, it's, they're just so, the mood is so beautiful. It is, it's amazing. In the material world, if someone's very qualified, usually they're very proud. And then they become demanding. But the spiritual platform is the opposite. The more that someone is qualified, the more that they think they have no good qualities. So you have this most exalted person and they're also incredibly humble. Isn't that amazing? Right? Um, there's... Um, Papa was giving a class. He was talking about Varnashram. And he was talking about the first class man, second class man, etc. And when he was giving that class, someone in the audience was getting, a, they were getting envious, right? They were angry. Uh, yeah, student, yeah. <laughs> and they challenged Prabhupada, you know, you think you're a first class man. And Prabhupada, his humility was incredible. He said, he said, you don't understand, he said, I'm a fifth class person because I'm the servant of everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And you can't fake that. It's not something that can be faked. It's, it's, it's something that has to be realized. So this, this same Prabhupada who could, who could be like a lion, I was just saying this morning, uncompromising, but he's uncompromising purely as a service to his beloved Raja and Krishna. It's, it's just it's something to, to meditate on. It's, they, these things are extremely... They don't exist on this material platform, actually. But they're very beautiful and it's very inspiring. If we can reflect on that. I'm your eternal servant, yet somehow or other I fall into this really bad space. Please help me to get out. Yeah? That's the mood. The mood is dependence, actually. The mood that we're trying to cultivate in Krishna consciousness is dependence on Krishna by dependence on Guru, dependence on Sadhu, dependence on Shastra, dependence on the Vaishnavas. Yeah. And, and it's like that. The more we are interdependent in a healthy way,
the more that we're protected. What Maya likes to do for a devotee is to isolate them. Because if, the, if Maya can isolate the devotee and get the devotee to the point where, you know, I don't talk to any of the devotees, you know, they don't know what they're talking about, I'm the only one who knows what I'm doing, they're all wrong, fine. What will happen after a while is the mind becomes a guru. And then when the mind becomes a guru, it's easy for Maya to just pull everyone away. Yeah? But the more, and Prabhupada gave this example with the sticks, he said that you have like one stick by itself, it can be broken very easily. Many sticks together, you can't break any of them. So as devotees, we actually need each other. Yeah? We really actually need each other. And as Maharaj was making the point, Krishna also speaks through the devotees. The devotees are literally Krishna's mouthpiece. Yeah? He's ready to offer all help, all assistance, if we really want to, to attain Him. And when we reflect on verses like this, they're actually also meant to inspire that desire to attain Krishna. Through the teachings, one of the benefits of the teachings is vairagya. A, an ability to detach from the material world, but not a false detachment. It's a detachment based upon having a deep and realized understanding of what the material world actually is. Because if it's understood properly, one is naturally detached actually. It's just like, well, and in addition to that, one has to have a higher taste. So, it's just like for many of us, when we came to Krishna Consciousness, we gave up eating meat. Right? You see for the devotees now, if you put meat in front of them, they'll never go near it. They'll just look at it and think, you want me to put a dead, a dead body in my mouth? No way, no way. Right? Very, very deep realization. It's not, and you know this, it's very natural. It's not like devotees are kind of like trying to stay away from the meat. It's just like, I would never, yeah, I wouldn't do it. Do you want to say, um, do, you have, do you have the microphone? Can we, yeah, please. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's um, yeah, it's it's but it's amazing. But that's also important because it's amazing how strong the material energy is. Mm. Prabhupada made a statement once. He said, "The trouble with my Western disciples is they're not afraid enough of Maya." You know, that's what he actually made that comment. They're not afraid enough of the material energy, and this verse is actually expressing that kind of fear. I fall into this horrible ocean of nescience, nescience, right? ignorance. Please be causelessly merciful to me, consider me a particle of dust at your lotus feet. This, this theme comes up again, that I'm part and parcel of you. So it's not artificial. We're not trying to do something artificial. We're not trying to become something that we're not. Actually, the majority of living entities on the planet are artificial. It, that's, the, that's the point. Material life means that someone's, someone is being something that they're not. And then a small group of people, small group of personalities, are trying to be natural again. So natural living is actually the devotional life. Yeah? And the material life is the artificial life. It's just that the majority of people do something, they call it normal. But it's actually artificial, technically speaking. Yeah? So the joy, the bliss, the happiness, Everything that people are looking for ultimately is found here. Yeah. So in Krishna consciousness, the only way is through. Yeah. The only way is through. If someone, to Maharaj's point, if someone has, has tasted Krishna consciousness and then tries to go back to material life, it becomes hellish. Because they say that Krishna consciousness is like the mafia, right? Once you join, you can never leave because you know too much. <laughs> they say, right? It really is like that. 
you can't enjoy any of the things anymore because you know too much. It's like that's obviously going to cause me to suffer. So it, we put ourselves in a very difficult situation. But therefore, the natural, the, the natural conclusion would be fully endeavor in something. This word shraddha, which often is taken to mean faith, shraddha, the, the prefix shrad comes from the word hrid. Rid, as in ridaya, it means heart. And da means shelter. So shraddha is literally the, the place where the heart finds shelter. They used to do this thing with boats. You'd have this big ship and um, it would move very slowly. So what they would do is they would take the anchor up on the big ship, they'll put the anchor into a small rowing boat and the rowing boat would go far ahead of the ship and then drop the anchor for, you know, ahead of the ship. And then they would reel themselves in. So the big ship would reel itself into wherever the anchor is placed. That is actually analogous to what we're meant to be doing as devotees. The heart is meant to be understood. This is actually what I should be doing. This is my goal. This is my determination, right? My sankalpa. This is my, my goal is I'm going to become Krishna conscious by the mercy of the devotees, by the mercy of my spiritual master, by Krishna's mercy. Then everything else, if I've made that determination, then everything else is like this. Everything else is my, myself, reeling myself to the realization of my own determination. Yeah. So it requires us to actually be very clear. What do you want? Do you ever ask yourself that? What do you really want? Yeah. What is it Prabhupada said about some of his disciples? He said, some of my disciples are shooting for the heavenly planets. Many, yeah. I was, just, yeah, I kind of, I was playing it down, but yeah, he said many. What do we want? How are we going to arrange our lives so we can take, we can fully experience all of this wonderful mercy that Krishna is, is offering us? He's saying, look, come. This is available for you. You come in this direction, and it's also he's also explaining that this this what is it? He says in, in this endeavor, there's no loss. Right? In a material endeavor, whatever you gain, it can be lost. That person that you see who's a nice person today, when, when their pious karma runs out, they'll be very different tomorrow. Yeah? People think, oh, it's, this person's, oh, these people are very nice. Yeah, but when their karma runs out, that will change. But the qualities of a devotee, they're actually coming from the soul. So they're eternal. Yeah? So again, what we have, this, even this word, sadhana, Right? Sadhas in sat, eternal. Dana also means wealth. Your sadhana is your eternal wealth, it's your eternal credit. Right? So every time we practice, every time we do this, engage in this devotional service, not only are you helping yourself, we're actually changing the atmosphere of the entire planet. Prabhupada will sometimes say that there should have been a third world war, but by the engagement of the Sankirtan mission, it was averted. Yeah. So this, this word yajna is very significant because when you perform sacrifice as a devotee, this nam sankirtan yajna, this sankirtan yajna, it is a blessing in your own life, but it's also a blessing in the life of the entire planet. It is, it, it is actually counteracting so much of the sinful behavior on the entire planet and it keeps everything in check. So we really, we really have to consider that. Yeah. So sometimes one may even think, even at times where I'm not so inspired to, to move forward for myself, I should still think, I have so many other relatives who are karmically related to me. If I can become Krishna conscious, they will benefit. In this environment, in the atmosphere of this earth planet, if we can become Krishna conscious, if we can do service, it will actually purify the environment. You know? Yeah, so it's, it's so subtle. Prabhupada was in America, it was in one state, and at that time, that state was a slaughterhouse capital of America, and the weather was bitterly cold. And Prabhupada told the devotees, he said, if you can get, just get them to close down these slaughterhouses, immediately the weather will change. Immediately the weather will change. So what we do in this Krishna consciousness movement, it benefits us, it benefits the movement, it benefits the entire world, actually. Yeah? And so, two things. Quality and quantity. Right? So we want to do our service with more and more quality. Refine it, better, 
more purity and quantity. We want to serve as, as much as we can for our benefit and for the benefit of the entire humanity. Yeah? Okay. Um, let me just see if there's anything else we want to share. Oh, maybe one more thing I'll share. A very interesting feature of a Shakti is that the spiritual attachment that comes from the Nam Sankirtan at this stage of a Shakti means that there's a spontaneous meditation on Krishna. In the material consciousness, our mind naturally goes towards material things. Has anyone never noticed that at all? Right. It naturally goes to material things and we have to pull it towards Krishna. At the stage of a Shakti, it's different. At the stage of a Shakti, the mind spontaneously and naturally flows towards remembrance of Krishna. Yeah. Even if someone is, 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 so let's say that that devotee, if someone is speaking to them about something mundane, their mind will spontaneously go and think that, uh, will, will come back to thinking about Krishna by its own, of its own accord. Naturally of its own accord. This is something that practicing devotees can look forward to. Uh, there will come a time in every devotee's life where the mind will naturally gravitate towards thoughts of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Naturally. And it's just, just, the under, just like when you love someone, right? You just, you just end up thinking about them. That kind of gravitation. And again, these are all symptoms of the nature of the soul. This is what's lost when we get covered in the material world, in the material, in the material identity. And this is what is regained as we practice spiritual life properly. Okay. So then maybe we'll stop there and then take some questions. <laughs>